You might remember the 1957 film Yangtze Incident, starring Richard Todd, all about a Royal Navy vessel trapped by communist forces deep inside China in 1949. Well, it's based upon real events. And if you think the film was dramatic, then it's not a patch on real life. This is the real story of HMS Amethyst, her crew, and a cat called Simon in the Yangtze Incident, 1949. On the 20th of April, 1949, the Royal Navy Swan Class Sloop, HMS Amethyst, was making her way upstream on the River Yangtze in China. The Royal Navy had been cruising the river, protecting British interests for a century. It was the result of a series of treaties in which Britain and other powers had applied pressure on the Chinese to open up their massive country to external trade. Many Chinese then and now refer to them as unequal treaties, as they were often the result of armed intervention by the Europeans, along with the Americans and Japanese. Think Opium Wars and the Boxer Rebellion. But after 100 years, things were changing. China was wracked in a bitter civil war between the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek and the communists under Mao Zedong. By April 1949, the war was turning in favour of the communists, whose forces were surging towards the nationalist capital of Nanking, now called Nanjing, about 150 miles up the Yangtze River from Shanghai. Nationalist forces had fallen back across the mighty Yangtze River, which was now becoming the front line in this conflict. And it was up that Yangtze River to Nanking that HMS Amethyst was sailing. HMS Amethyst was being sent to relieve another ship, HMS Consort, which was guarding the British Embassy. When the Amethyst's captain, Lieutenant Commander Bernard Skinner, arrived there, his duty was to provide a deterrence should the Communists try to seize the Embassy. His ship would then evacuate British and Commonwealth nationals trapped in the city. And he certainly had the means to act as a deterrent. HMS Amethyst was armed with six 4-inch quick-firing dual-purpose anti-aircraft guns. Launched in 1942, the Amethyst, which was 283 feet in length, had successfully sunk a German U-boat in February 1945. Fast forward to 1949 and HMS Amethyst was part of the Royal Navy's Far East Station. Having left the British colony of Hong Kong in March, she had moved up the coast to Shanghai before entering the Yangtze, heading for Nanking on the 19th of April. On board was 17-year-old boy sailor Sidney Horton, the youngest member of the crew, who'd enlisted when he was 15. Ever so slightly older than Horton was ordinary seaman George Hickenbottom. While stationed in Hong Kong, Hickenbottom had come across a stray kitten. Smuggling him onto HMS Amethyst, the kitten became a big hit with the crew, who named him Simon. Simon seemed to enjoy bringing dead rats to various members of the crew, and after those hard exertions, found the perfect place to have a sleep, in the captain's cap. So, here was Simon, along with Hickenbottom, Boy Sailor Horton, and the rest of the crew of HMS Amethyst, sailing up the Yangtze River on the morning of the 20th of April, 1949. Sometime before 9am, still about 70 miles short of their destination, she suddenly came under small arms fire from the north bank, the communist side of the river. If you've seen the 1957 film, you probably have an image of the River Yangtze. Only problem, it was actually filmed on the River Orwell in Suffolk. Large though it is, the Orwell is no Yangtze. The river in China rises on the Tibetan Plateau and winds its way 4,000 miles to the sea at Shanghai. By the time it reaches the spot where HMS Amethyst was sailing, it's roughly a mile wide, with islands and treacherous sandbars rising at various points. So the rifle fire from the north bank was probably about half a mile away. More concerning was that a communist shore battery also joined in. Ten shells fell way short of HMS Amethyst. And as they were so far from his ship, Lieutenant Commander Skinner concluded that he'd sailed into an artillery duel between the communists on the north bank and the nationalists on the south. Nevertheless, he ordered the ship to battle stations, displayed two huge Union flags on either side of the hull to identify themselves as neutrals, and then increased speed away from the communists. An hour later, having passed the city of Jianying, Skinner followed the river as it swung west towards Nanking. It was as he negotiated this wide bend in the river that his ship came under fire from the north bank again. Any lingering thought that he and the crew had that they were simply caught in yet more crossfire was swiftly dissipated when a shell hit the ship. They were the targets. Things happened very quickly. Suddenly the bridge took a direct hit, leaving the captain mortally wounded. Command passed to Lieutenant Geoffrey Weston, who was himself injured in that shell blast. Also wounded was the ship's cat, Simon. He was found crawling along the deck 
and the surgeon removed four pieces of shrapnel from him. Next, the wheelhouse took a direct hit. Leading seaman Leslie Frank, who was acting coxswain, was injured. Despite his injury, he struggled to steer the ship, but his efforts were nullified when the power failed. HMS Amethyst slew to the port and grounded on a small island, named Rose Island, in the middle of the river. Unable to move, the Amethyst was now a sitting duck for the batteries on the north bank of the river. All but one of her gun turrets were put out of action, and thanks to the ship's list when she grounded, the last gun was unable to get a trajectory to fire on the communist positions. The shells kept coming, the sick bay was hit, next the port engine room, finally shells penetrated the generator and the communications rooms. Before the comms room was temporarily put out of action, Lieutenant Weston managed to send a hasty message stating the situation and his position. 17-year-old boy sailor Sidney Holton made his way to the wheelhouse to find it completely shattered and only one crewman still able to walk. He helped take the wounded to the mess deck below, which the ship's surgeon and his assistant had turned into a temporary hospital. Next, Horton went up to the bridge, and again it was a wreck, with Lieutenant Commander Skinner lying with the life draining from him. Another officer, Lieutenant Berger, had lost most of his clothes in the shell blast. Horton was now ordered to assist with the distribution of Lee Enfield rifles to the crew. It was all they had left to defend themselves. Lieutenant Weston issued the order to repel boarders. The acting captain now ordered anyone who could be spared to be evacuated onto the comparative safety of the island. A boat was lowered. Some of the crew chose to swim. Both the boat and the swimmers came under fire. Amazingly, 59 ratings and four Chinese mess boys made it. Only two men couldn't be accounted for. Finally, at around 11am, the shelling from the north bank stopped. In the previous hour and a half, HMS Amethyst had received 50 hits. 19 of her crew lay dead. Nearly 30 were wounded. The crew that remained on the ship started to plug holes in the hull using hammocks and bedding, and all the while keeping their heads down from communist snipers. Stuck on Rose Island, how could the crew, let alone HMS Amethyst herself, escape? Oh, before I go on, if you enjoy my work, then why not sign up for my free weekly newsletter? There's a link appearing now and in the description. Anyway, back to the story. Lieutenant Weston's urgent message had been picked up by the Royal Navy's Far Eastern Station. The second in command, Vice Admiral Madden, immediately sent three ships to the rescue. Sailing from Shanghai was HMS London. Over twice the size of the Amethyst, she boasted eight eight inch guns, along with four four inch guns. She was accompanied by the Amethyst's sister ship, HMS Black Swan. Meanwhile, up in Nanking, the ship that the Amethyst was supposed to be replacing, HMS Consort, was ordered to head downstream. Her captain, Commander Ian Robertson, weighed anchor and steamed at 30 knots, the fastest a British warship had ever travelled the Yangtze, the 70-odd miles east to the stricken Amethyst. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she arrived on the scene and proceeded to bombard the Communist shore batteries as she passed Rose Island. Turning about two miles downriver, she now steamed back up, once more firing her four and a half inch guns at the Communist positions. 17-year-old Sidney Horton later wrote that the crew on HMS Consort were so calm and collected as they went about their duties that he felt proud to be British. The rescue ship then attempted to tow Amethyst off the island, but she was too heavy. Weston ordered the crew to throw as much ballast as possible overboard, but still the ship remained stuck. By now the communists were regrouping and starting to fire back. During this rescue attempt, HMS Consort was hit by shells 56 times. Ten of her crew were killed, a further 23 wounded. The ship's steering mechanism was damaged and Commander Robertson was reduced to steering using his twin screws. In danger of joining the Amethyst stuck halfway up the Yangtze, Robertson reluctantly headed downstream to await the arrival of His Majesty's ships London and Black Swan. As darkness fell, the crew continued throwing anything not needed overboard and finally, in the early hours of the 21st of April, Lieutenant Weston was able to float the damaged sloop. He sailed her two miles up the river, but could go no further, as her charts for this stretch of the water had been destroyed, and her hull had been holed in numerous places. Just for good measure, Lieutenant Commander Skinner had now died, the ship's surgeon and his assistant had been killed on that opening day, Weston himself was injured, and there was only one telegraphist, Jack French, to handle all the communications. Meanwhile, HMS Consort had rendezvoused with the London and Black Swan near Jianying. When Commander Robertson reported the damage to his ship, he was ordered to proceed to Shanghai to arrange burial for his dead. As the sun rose, the crew, or what remained of them on HMS Amethyst, heard distant gunfire. The mighty HMS London was coming to the rescue. 
Actually, HMS London might have been significantly bigger and better armed than the Amethyst and the accompanying Black Swan, but she didn't cower the People's Liberation Army, now gathering on the North Shore, preparing for their next offensive. The Communist batteries gave as good as they got. HMS London was hit ten times, and both ships were ultimately ordered to withdraw. There would be no rescue for HMS Amethyst. As the afternoon wore on, the crew could see PLA boats crossing the river as part of their new offensive. On the south shore, many of the Nationalist defenders simply switched sides. The whole reason for the Amethyst role to protect the embassy in Nanking was about to become irrelevant. The Communist offensive captured the city just two days later. Sidney Horton later recalled the absolute sense of dejection that descended on the crew. The men of the Amethyst were on their own, in the middle of hostile territory. The following day, the 22nd of April, the British naval attaché from their embassy in Nanking, Lieutenant Commander John Kerens, arrived to take over command from the injured Lieutenant Weston. Things were looking up, and they seemed even brighter when later that day an RAF Sunderland flying boat from Hong Kong managed to land nearby on the river and send across a replacement surgeon. However, PLA fire forced the Sunderland to take off again pretty quickly. The 33-year-old Kerens now engaged in a series of negotiations with the surrounding communists. The local PLA commander, Yi Fei, conveyed the demands of the communist leadership that the Western powers withdraw from China and that Kerens admit that the HMS Amethyst had opened fire in an unprovoked attack on the PLA forces. Kerens refused. In the 1980s, an elderly Yi Fei admitted that it was his troops who had actually opened fire first. For the next 10 weeks, Kerens attended 19 meetings. It was classic mind game stuff, two steps forward, one step back. During that period, the PLA did not fire on the ship, but then there was no need to. HMS Amethyst was going nowhere. In fact, the communists were happy to let the crew run out of food and then they'd have no option but to surrender. What a great PR coup for the Chinese. Fortunately for the crew of the Amethyst, they'd left Shanghai with a full stock of supplies for both their journey and their intended guard duty. They were also carrying extra stock for the embassy in case of some sort of siege. Amazingly, considering the damage and casualties from that opening day bombardment, the galley had survived intact. And not a single man of the galley team had been wounded, let alone killed. So, unbeknownst to the Chinese, food was not in short supply. Actually, there was one danger to their food supplies. Rats. During those long weeks, the ship became infested with the rodents. Fortunately, there was one crew member who saved the day. Do you remember Simon the Cat? <laughs> he was a kitten on a mission. He was a killing machine. Eventually, he cornered and fought to the death a huge rat, which the crew nicknamed Mao Zedong, a jibe at the communist leader. He raised the crew's morale so much that they gave him the honorary rank of Able Sea Cat. More about him later. As the weeks passed, spring turned into summer and the humidity on the Royal Navy ship started to make life a lot less comfortable. No one was struggling more than the telegraphist, Jack French. Kerens noticed that trying to run the whole communication show by himself in that heat was starting to take a serious mental toll on him. At the beginning of July, the food supplies were dwindling enough for Kerens to order the crew onto half rations. Time was running out for the crew of HMS Amethyst. And so, on the night of the 30th, 31st of July, 1949, Kerens decided to make a break for the sea. For the previous weeks, he'd been secretly preparing the ship. The anchor chain was greased to silence that telltale sound that would alert the Chinese that they were on the move. He also used black canvas to change the ship's silhouette, and painted any white areas black so they didn't stand out at night, should the PLA fire flares. That night, just as they were about to silently move off, a brightly lit passenger boat came down the river. Kerens moved up behind her in the dark and followed in her wake. Despite following the brightly lit ship, Kerens had no chance for the next 10 miles river. One wrong turn could put him on a sandbar. He was reduced to using the ship's echo sounder to gauge the depth of the water in front of him. So far, so good. But eventually his luck ran out. Just a few miles downstream, the passenger boat was challenged. She gave the correct answer. But then some sharp eyes on the shore spotted a black boat travelling in her wake. They challenged this unknown black boat. The amethyst wasn't able to respond. Immediately, artillery and small arms erupted from both shores. Kerens ordered as much power as possible, and blowing black smoke, he surged past the passenger ship, missing her by just a few feet. The PLA soldiers were now firing at anything they could see on the river, which was principally the brightly lit passenger boat. 
It was later reported that the boat sank with many casualties. HMS Amethyst, however, managed to get clear. Through the rest of that nerve-jangling night, she sailed closer and closer to safety. And then at about half past five in the morning on the 31st of July, she saw HMS Concord waiting for her just upriver from Shanghai. In fact, the Concord had anchored close to the Wusung Fort to provide covering fire should the Chinese forces inside open up on the Amethyst. As it was, the fort's guns remained silent. HMS Concord accompanied Amethyst towards where the mighty Yangtze empties into the East China Sea. Lieutenant Commander Kerens now sent a signal to the Far Eastern Fleet. Have rejoined the fleet south of Wusung. No damage, no casualties. God save the king. Sailing first to Hong Kong, HMS Amethyst then sailed back to Britain. In November, she arrived at Devonport to a hero's welcome. The crew were all invited to meet King George VI at Buckingham Palace. Kerens was awarded the Distinguished Service Order. Lieutenant Geoffrey Weston was awarded a bar to the Distinguished Service Cross that he'd received earlier in his career. There was also a DSC for Lieutenant Berger, the officer who'd lost most of his clothes when the bridge had taken that direct hit. Jack French, the one-man communications team, received the Distinguished Service Medal. Also receiving DSMs were Leonard Williams from the engine room and acting petty officer and coxswain, Leslie Frank. Further medals for gallantry were awarded to the pilot of the Sunderland flying plane, plus four crewmen on HMS London and three on HMS Consort, including a DSO for Commander Robertson. There's one more medal for gallantry that does need to be mentioned. The Dickin Medal is often called the Animal Victoria Cross. Since its inception in 1943, 37 dogs, 32 pigeons and 5 horses have received the honour. But only one cat, Simon from HMS Amethyst. En route back to England, Simon received so much fan mail that a crew member had to be assigned just to open and reply to all the letters. On his arrival in Plymouth, he, like animals entering the UK at that time, was placed in quarantine. Unfortunately, he picked up a virus which exacerbated the injuries sustained on the Yangtze, and little Simon passed away on the 28th of November. Hundreds, including the whole crew from HMS Amethyst, attended his funeral at the Pet Cemetery in Ilford, East London. The story of HMS Amethyst was told in the 1957 film Yangtze Incident. It starred a real-life war hero, Richard Todd, as Lieutenant Commander Kerins. Acting coxswain Leslie Frank was played by William Hartnell, who would go on to become the first Doctor Who. Several other notable British actors were in the film, including Bernard Cribbins. The film was released in the USA under a variety of names, Battle Hell, Escape of the Amethyst, and Their Greatest Glory. HMS Amethyst played herself in the film, although by then, as she was listed for scrapping, her engine had been removed, so the moving shots involved another ship. But being a film star could not prevent the inevitable. She was scrapped later that year. By then, HMS London and HMS Black Swan had gone the same way, and HMS Consort joined them in 1961. Their passing was almost symbolic. The days of Britannia ruling the waves, of gunboat diplomacy, and of Royal Navy vessels sailing deep inland in China, were now things of the past. After the Opium Wars, the Taiping Rebellion with Chinese Gordon, not forgetting the Boxer Rising, the Yangtze Incident, with the loss of 50 British servicemen, was to be Britain's last war in China. If you're a fan of my work, then please support me so I can research and tell even more stories from history. In return for your support, you'll get access to exclusive members-only episodes, opportunities to join me for live discussions, and a few extra perks along the way too. Click on the links appearing now or in the description. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.